I'll join with the earth and I'll give my praise to you. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. to Ghana, West Africa several times. And we, my first time was in 2007 without Van, and at that time as a nurse I did wound care. Can we show the first slide? We, I met at the time a young man named Alex Papa Ezi, and you can see him up there. He had horrific wounds on his ankles. And the next slide please. And so every day I did wound care on him. And when I came home, I could not forget this young man. Somehow I just couldn't return to my comfortable American lifestyle and forget Alex. So we found him, we raised money for him, and these uh, precancerous tumors twice were removed, once in 2008, again in 2011, multiple skin grafts. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? We returned in 2013, and the, the tumors had returned. This is the third time. And here you can see he has a family. He has a wife and three young children. And um, through 
much decision, Alex decided to undergo bilateral lower leg amputations to get rid of the tumors, which is huge in their culture. Next uh, slide, please. So here he is. He had the amputations a year ago, and last May he was fitted with prosthetic lower legs. And now, thank God, he is tumor free and he can live a normal life. In the meantime, they have not been working. Uh, with all the months of having his legs elevated for skin grafts to heal, he had given up his bicycle repair business. Faustina, his wife, had undergone a hairdressing um, apprenticeship, but it would cost about $3,000 to set her up in some kind of, of a business. So we are here now this morning to talk about helping these people to become self-sufficient. And I'll let Van talk about uh, the small business loan. Right uh, up until today, we've really been helping Alex. Uh, obviously, it's helped his family, but it's been an effort to help one individual. And one of our concerns is that's only one individual out of thousands or millions over there who need help. And so our, our current dream is to come up with a way of funding or providing funds to establish a revolving loan fund that can be used to uh, assist uh, Faustina uh, start her business and Alex uh, get into uh, uh, a, a proper facility to uh, conduct um, bicycle repairs. Uh, can you do the next slide? Uh, in the back, uh, you can't read this on the screen, but there's a, a business plan uh, for Faustina. Next slide. This is a very typical shop <clears throat> in Ghana. Uh, open air, there's a, a typically a little building or a container, a small container, that is used uh, for the shop. And um, all kinds of activities are conducted in these open air uh, shops. Next slide. Including hair salon. Uh, Faustina, as Lauren mentioned, has uh, received some training uh, as, as a beautician or hair salon, hairstylist or whatever. So her business plan is to uh, open a small shop and uh, pay back a loan that we hopefully will be able to fund. And that, the proceeds from that uh, can be used then for other people in their community or in their region to open up other businesses and to conduct uh, some self-sustaining and family-sustaining uh, activity or enterprise. So the goal is to grow from one individual, from helping one individual, to helping his family, now that would be a multiplier of five, and even on to others in the community and hopefully many more people. Uh, the funding would be managed through Ghana Christian Mission. Uh, they have made it very clear to Alex and Faustina that once this is provided, if it can be provided, they're really going to have to be on their own and make it work. And uh, they will have a local supporter, counselor, uh, who will meet with them weekly to, um, to make sure they're on the right track and on the right path. And they understand that if they're not able to repay the loan, then not to us, but to the fund, then no one else in their community will be able to uh, pick up the, the baton, if you will, and move forward. So our, our hope and our goal is to raise about $5,000 uh, that will provide funding for them to start businesses, but also to support them and their family uh, until those businesses are, are up and running. So if it's uh, in your heart to uh, provide some funding, uh, to support Alex and his family and their community through uh, this revolving fund. Uh, we'd appreciate your support. We'll be outside in the back at the end of the service. Thank you. Um, a few more slides. This is... Uh... Oh. Sorry. Uh, this is Alex. Right now, he performs his bicycle uh, repair business under trees on the dirt, and that's fine when it doesn't rain, but when it rains, uh, it's a sea of mud, and uh, he can't conduct his business. So the goal for him is somewhat less um, ambitious. He needs a cement pad and some kind of a roof over his head. But um, uh, that's how he currently supports his family. Thank you.
we get uh, started, a couple family business items. Saw a new guest here today, Mr. Jacob Atkins. <laughs> Turn around and face this crowd. <clears throat> uh, you got a new haircut since I saw you last. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so who are you working for now? Uh, the U.S. military. The U.S. military specifically? The Army. The Army. Are we on? Hold on. What do I got to do? <clears throat> U.S. military. Army. Where? Uh, right now I'm stationed at Fort Gordon, Georgia, um, finishing up AIT, but uh, I just got my orders to, um, I'll be stationed in Fort Campbell, Kentucky with 101st Airborne. Okay, and what will you be doing? What's your aim? Uh, well, my job in the Army is at 25 November, that's what it's called. It's uh, networking and making sure they have, you know, communications to the soldiers on the field. So, yeah. Well, we're happy for you, buddy. Thank you. Also, uh, we have a couple here who's about to take a trip. No. 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 They don't know I'm going to do this. This is Matt and Kelsey Martin. And uh, how long have you guys been here? I've been here two years. My wife's been here a year and a half. Year and a half, because how long have you been married? I've been married a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you guys don't have any questions here. And uh, you guys are going where this week? Back home to Cincinnati. You are. It's a rough crowd here today. <laughs> Just <say that. laughs> Well, these folks have been uh, highly involved in our church. And I just want to say, I, I told this to Matt last week, there's some people who come and they don't get involved because they aren't going to be here long. These folks knew they were going to be here just a short time, and they jumped in with both feet into the Young People's Program, specifically Awana. And uh, many of these kids who are not in this room right now, just left, um, have really appreciated you guys. You guys are really special, and we're really happy for you. Thank you. Anyone else want to say something? <laughs> As you can see, uh, we're doing Operation Christmas Child, and uh, we're really proud we can be a part of that. And when do we start bringing in boxes? Uh, as of now, I guess. So let's go ahead and uh, bring your boxes in. Uh, they'll be shipped around the world. I just talked to somebody this morning. I don't remember who it was. And uh, they said that they put the picture of their family in the box. And so when they got it to the, uh, to the other side, they heard back that the children, or the child in this case, said, this is my family. And I thought, what an awesome idea that is. So if you guys wouldn't mind just taking a selfie and uh, putting that right in there. <laughs> It is a tough crowd today, so. <laughs> well, we're, we're glad you all are here, and <clears throat> I want to say we're finishing up a series on questions for God. Uh, this is a series that we started uh, back uh, in the spring. I've been 21 weeks doing this, and what we did is we had uh, people put on a card. If you could ask God a question, what would you ask? And so we've done uh, all these different weeks, and today is my day. Here's my question. And it's a, it's a question I've had for years, and <clears throat> I thought I'd share a little bit with you as to my discovery or my answer to my own question um, this morning. My question is, why did God choose me? Why did he choose me? He could have chose all sorts of other people, and many people he did choose, but why did he choose me? It's a very humbling question. And I trust as we study this this morning that you will grow in your respect for God and for who he is and realize that there is a place for you um, because of what God has done. So take your notes, please, that were in your bulletin. If you didn't get some, just uh, raise your hand. 
I'd like you to ponder these concepts. You see, I, I think part of the challenge that we have in our relationships that we have with people are we look at life based on, and relationships, based on what we get out of it. It's not so much what we give to it, it's what we get out of it. And we value people or like others because, I have listed here four things, because you're beautiful, because you're athletic, because you have money, or because I feel powerful when I'm with you. You empower me. And it's like, you know, I understand that. And that's, they're all natural things to do. But when it came to God and his relationship with me, had nothing to do with that. Had zero to do with that. And I just want to walk with you. What does the Bible say? The Bible doesn't really answer the question, why did, jo why did God choose Dave Lind? It doesn't say anything like that. But it does give some indications of what God was up to when he did. And it would be the same for you. And I hope as you ponder this, that it will cause you to deeply respect God. So let's look at a couple of verses. I'm going to have you take your Bibles and turn <clears throat> to first uh, to uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians is uh, one of my favorite New Testament books. And Paul writes in a powerful way about his walk with God. The question is, for the first one, is when, when did God choose me? And it says so in verse 4 and 5. For he, meaning God, chose us in him before the creation of the world. Now just ponder that for a little bit. He, cre he chose us before we were born, before there was any one of us here. Now he didn't choose everybody, but he chose us. And when I say us, I mean those who are born again, born from above, who've repented and turned to Christ. He chose us before anything was started. So it wasn't based on our looks, our wealth, our personality, our talents, our skills, projects that we've done for him to impress him. He chose us before all that. He chose us before the foundation of the world. He chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now, he chose us that way because that's who he is. He's holy and blameless. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Christ Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will. Now, there are people who have children, and then there are people who choose to have children. It says here that God chose us. It was a system. He chose to, uh, to adopt us into a family. None of us is born into the family of God. We're adopted into the family. So that means that God chose us. He predestined us. That was before time to be adopted. And it says also for his good pleasure. It wasn't about our good pleasure, though there is great benefits and we are pleased with that. But it was for his good pleasure that he chose us. He wanted to share in his glory. So when did God choose you? Before the foundation of the world. Jeremiah speaks in chapter 31, verse 3. He says this, The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. You know, we did nothing to merit God's love. He just gave it to us. That's pretty impressive. And you can't take credit for it. So the second question is, is what is my value? And there's a lot of talk out there. A lot of people with all sorts of problems think they're worth nothing. They're lower than the snake's belly in a wagon wheel type thing, you know? They're scum. They're, I mean, they've done bad things or they've had bad things happen to them. And they feel terrible. Well, good thing we don't have to base our life on feelings. When I was in uh, Chicago, uh, <laughs> the people across the street um, were, uh, a, a church was, I don't know how 
picture it, but picture, the church was here, there was a street, and then there was a house directly opposite us. And <clears throat> they were interesting group. And uh, thought our church was kind of loud, you know, and uh, enthusiastic. And they started coming to church to check it out. And uh, kind of a rough background. And pretty soon they started getting involved and they had their five kids come and they got became Christians and their kids became Christians and they became loud too and <laughs> they had fun and they had remarried each other. They had divorced and then they had remarried each other in the process. And they realized who God was. And today they're missionaries over in Japan. And uh, great people. But Rich, the husband's name, he came uh, to church one day with a t-shirt. And uh, on the back it says, God don't make junk. Now, grammatically it was kind of crude. But I haven't forgotten it. That's been some 30 years ago that I saw that. God don't make junk. And I wish we as Christians could understand the crudeness of that. God doesn't make junk. You see, if you're going to redeem junk, you don't need much, right? To redeem junk. But if you have something that's priceless, I mean priceless, you can't even put a price to it. You need something extremely valuable for the exchange. When Christ died on the cross, he was the extreme epitome of value and worth and cost. And he gave his life as a ransom for you and you and you and me. And he paid it all with his life. If it was that priceless of a cost, and redeeming factor, then that makes us what? Eternally valuable. We are very worthy. We have uh, worth. Unlimited worth. But we are not worthy. Understand the difference. We have great worth, but we don't, excuse me, we have uh, unlimited worth, but we're not worthy of it. This is what Christ said. And I, and I hope you understand that when you walk out of here and stuff happens to you and you think, woe is me, just realize that you are of unlimited worth, precious in the sight of God. Precious enough to if you were the only person in the world, he would have died for you. Now that's pretty impressive. The world doesn't hold that value. But as Christians, we understand this. The third question is, is what is God's action and attitude toward us? How does God react toward us? And I think Romans 5.8 is a great text. You should have it highlighted. It says this, but God demonstrated his love for us. And that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates his love. That's present tense. He continues to demonstrate again and again and again. That we're of value. That he cares for us. He took action. When we were at enemies with God... When we were not friends, but enemies, that's when he died for us. You know, we think about war and all the tragedy of that. How many people will die for their enemy? You say, no, nobody. Nobody's going to go die for their enemy. They fight against their enemy. In Romans, Paul writes, while we're enemies with God, he died for us. 
See, this is all about God here. This is his action and his attitude. He loves us. He paid the price. Peter writes in 2 Peter 3.9. Peter, of course, denied the Lord three times. And you wonder uh, how much thinking did he do after he denied the Lord? The Lord said he was going to deny him. He denied he was going to deny, and then he denied. But he writes this. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He didn't want anyone to be lost or to perish. That's his heart desire. Have you responded to him yet? Are you living the life that he would say applaud? Question four. How do I know if I'm chosen? John 6, says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. In other words, God has to be involved for you to become a Christian. And he is the one that initiates it. He is the one that calls out to you. He is the one that prompts you with his spirit. He's the one that reveals sin in your life. He is the one that draws you to himself. And it says, unless he gets engaged in that process, you won't come. You're not chosen. But by looking at you, I can't tell if you're chosen or not. Nobody can. We don't know. God knows, but we don't. And so when we present the gospel, we present it and offer it as a gift and say, this is God's good news. What will you do with it? Are you chosen or not? Drop down in your notes just a little further there, mid-page. Actually, turn to Romans chapter 8, because that's a... You should have this. It's right after Romans 8, 28. You know, we all memorize Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. We know that verse. But right after that verse comes this great truth of a process that happens to someone who is called, who God calls to become a Christian. It says this, For those God foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that we might be the firstborn of many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And so there's a process. Once you start into the process, whoever is called will be called and will become a Christian. And I've, I grew up in the church. I grew up in the little Baptist church in Wallingford. The first Baptist church there. And so I've heard lots and lots of sermons. I mean, lots of them. I mean, I've preached a lot of sermons but I, now, but I've heard a lot of sermons. And we talk about being called or not. And when you're in Bible school, you sit around and discuss these things. Is it your choice? Is it God's call? Or whatever it is. And you have to understand some things about who God is. It's not about us initiating the process. It's about God doing what he does. It's about evangelism and about sharing your faith. And there's a lot of theological discussion that goes on here. But for me, I like simple pictures that I can understand. I've often wondered, you know, when somebody comes to Christ and their life is a mess and, and I see this radical change, what happened in their life? And then others seemed like they were perfect people anyway, and yet they repent and come to Christ. And I, I look at the two of them, and I say, how can that be? You know, they're so different. But God has that ability to deal with that. And probably the best picture that I ever heard about understanding the the difference between God choosing and our free will is this illustration I'm going to give you right here. Is you <clears throat> look at a door, if there was a door here to go into heaven. 
And <clears throat> so you're outside, heaven's inside there, and you're outside here, and you look at heaven and you say, how can I know if I was called or not to come into heaven? Isn't that a fair question? I mean, I think that's a fair question. And written over the door frame is a scripture verse. It says this. It's in your notes. It's out of Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Simple verse. Does it matter about your financial status? Your 401k? Does it matter what career you have? Does it matter about your education? Your ethnicity? Does it matter whether you're a boy or a girl? Does it matter if you're an American or someone from New Zealand? Does it matter about anything like that? It matters nothing. It says, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There's a big discussion in Jesus' days. Who, you know, Jesus spent all his time with publicans and sinners. And he said, I'm with them because they know they need help. I'm not here to call those who don't need help. And I thought one day, when I was nine years old, and there was a preacher preaching in my church. And he said, bow your heads, close your eyes. And I bowed my head and I did not close my eyes. I folded my hands and I put them over my eyes. And I peeked around. And he said the gospel to me. Oh, I'd seen people go forward before. But that day, I realized I was a whosoever. I was just a person in need of Christ. Have you wrestled that through yet? So on the outside looking in, it says, whosoever will call is saved. That's pretty awesome. That sounds like my, my uh, job, right? My freedom to choose. And yet when you die and you go to heaven, you look back at that same door that you just came through and you look back and there's another verse written on top of that same door. Another Bible verse. Chosen before the creation of the world. Ephesians 1, 4. Chosen before the foundation of the world. Chosen before you were even born. You were chosen my goodness, that doesn't sound like it was my choice at all then, does it? But on the outside, it looked like it was my choice. Once I got in, though, I realized that God had moved in my spirit and showed me who I was. And I repented, and I came to Christ. Have you done that? So if <clears throat> we're to respond to Christ, so what? Does that mean now I just won't go to hell? I'll now go to heaven? That's part of it. But there's a life to be lived here for what now? Now that someone has bought my passage and has changed my life and has wiped away the sin that was there and now has created a new life in me, what is my response to that person? What is my response back to God? And this is not a static thing. This is something that's ongoing. Here are several of them that I think of. What do I owe back? You know, we talk about someone who saves someone, and then they owe them their life. I like that. Here's what it says. Question number five is, what is to be my response to his love and grace? What's my response? I think there's several. One is, I owe him my life now. See, I've been redeemed. My life was, had failed and he bought it back and he says here's your new life I owe him my devotion my focus it's not just living life and working and eating and going back home to sleep and getting up the next day and working and eating and sleeping it's more than that it's he created me for a purpose a specific purpose a design I'm to live out that purpose. 
I own my finances. The Bible says he gives me the ability to earn a living. He's the one that does that. Now I have to work, but he creates in me a heart to work and to, that's what he does. And I give back my tithes and offering. I own my worship because of who he is. Not because of who I am, but because of who he is. And I, we command him, the singing this morning was glorious and it was praiseworthy and we sing praises back to God and we say, thank you. I own my worship. I want to come on Sunday morning. When I come to church on Sunday morning, it's not like I just roll in to see what's happening, what the show is, and change the channel. And if I don't like it, it's just I come in because I am prepared to come and worship corporately with my brothers and sisters here and those who are seeking God and say, I am here to worship God and focus on Him. I owe my service. What's that? It's like, that's part of who I am. In other words, a non-serving Christian doesn't make sense. The two words are oxymoron. It doesn't fit a non-serving Christian. That doesn't make sense. You serve the king. I'm his servant. Where are you serving in the Christian community? Do you know what, you're, what you should be doing? Are you enjoying it? Do you have a good attitude? You should serve every day of your life. Why? Because I'm serving the king. I've been bought with a price. I am to rejoice and I will have hope. Sometimes I see glum Christians. It's like, you know, they're grumpy. Like, why are you grumpy? Mr. Mark, I remember a conversation we had. Mark, Mark Triller's here this morning and I just thought of him. <laughs> Mark, what did, what did you tell me one day many years ago that you were what? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we sat and we had in the restaurant and he's saying, I, you know, Dave, I feel snarly. That's pretty picturesque. And I said, so what do you, what do you think it, what you need to do about that? He goes, no, I think I need a vacation. I said, Mark, I think you need more than that. <laughs> and Mark committed his life to Christ. Are you snarling anymore, Mark? <laughs> Some habits are hard to get rid of, aren't they? Huh? <laughs> Mark is a good Christian businessman and dad and husband. And uh, thank you, Mark. At least you're honest. <laughs> But Christian snarly, Christian shouldn't be snarly. I understand when somebody steps on your foot, you might yelp a little bit. But come on, look at, look at the honor and privilege we have as Christians. Who am I to complain on any level, really, because of what, I've, what has been done for me? I have hope upon hope. The world didn't give it to me, and the world will not take away. They can't take it away. We see Christians persecuted today in the world around us. And what happens is when Christians are persecuted, it only rises up in the hearts of others to take their place and say, I will stand for Christ then. The other response is, I will tell others of Christ. It's like this living thing. You don't have to force it out of somebody who is committed to Christ. They naturally talk about Christ and what he's doing in their life. It comes natural. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says this. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You have been bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. That's pretty strong words there. Just think if we understood that and lived that out in our Christian community, how that would change so much of what we do say and think. To glorify God with a body, it's not your body anymore. It's God's. You were purchased and redeemed. The final question is, have you received Christ's eternal gift for you? I mean, there's a gift for you. 
1 John 5.13, these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. That, do you know that? Do you know that? Not do you think that or hope that, but do you know that? The Bible says you can know. So, some of you have heard the gospel presentation before, but let's do it again. And there may be someone here this morning who says, you know what, it's my time. So here it is. It's real simple. Man was created by God to share fellowship with God into eternity. And he was in fellowship with God and walked with God in the garden. And it was unbelievable. And then he chose to go his independent way to not believe in God and to, to go his own way. And what happened is, is God says, I will go over here. Actually, man went over there. God is over there. And now man is over here because man hid from God in the garden, it says. And that sin, that choice, that self-will has been passed in generations through men all the way down to you and I. And so now we have this issue with God. And so there's this, this chasm that separates us from God. And man says, you know, I really miss being in fellowship with God. I want to go back to God. And so he tries to build bridges back to God. But this chasm is thousands of miles deep and thousands of miles wide, picturesque. It's the Grand Canyon of Grand Canyons. And there's no way we can build a bridge far enough, even though we try to do good works or we go to church or give money or be nice to people and all those kinds. Of, it's not good enough. The Bible says all our good works is filthy rags. There's no way to get back to God. And so we have a problem. So what God did is he says, I will send my son because I love mankind. They're of unlimited value to me. I will send the greatest price that I ever have, my own son. And he will die on the cross to pay for them who don't love me. But I love them. So Christ died on the cross paying your sins and mine. A hundred percent. Past, present, and future. Pretty amazing. The biggest sacrifice ever. And now, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So there is a way to God now through the cross of Christ, and man can travel across the cross to God. And it can be in relationship with God again. Now, that's an amazing thing. It's not as, now it's forever he's with God. And we think it's our choice, but actually God had called us, and we just responded to the call. That's pretty amazing. Who wouldn't want that? To be forgiven of all that stuff, and to start over again, to be set free. My friends, if you have not heard the call before, today is a great day. To say, I want that. Now, when I committed my life to Christ, I was nine years old. And I peaked. You can peak too. I'm going to have several of the folks who've been up for prayer team, if they come up and be ready to share the gospel. What I'd like to say is, if you'd like to come to Christ, well, we're going to sing a song here in just a bit. But <clears throat> why don't the worship team come up? But if you'd like to say, today's my day that I would like to commit my life to Christ, then you come today. It's a day when it's pretty awesome. It's a gift. So let me just pray with you so you can hear what the issue is. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. And this morning we come to you and for those who need to commit their life to Christ to say, I admit this morning that I'm a sinner. I've sinned against a holy God and I admit I'm wrong. And I'm really sorry, Lord, for that. 
I have caused you grief. But I believe that you paid for my price. You washed my sins away on the cross. And you set me free. I ask that you apply that to my account this day. I give you control of my life. And I ask you to come in and take control of me. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior from this day forward. I want to honor you with my life. And I believe one day you'll come back for me. I pray that in Christ's name. Also, for some of you, maybe you aren't living where God, where God wants you to live. And you're just kind of playing with God. You know, that's not a good place to be. God can bring some uh, things into your life to get your attention. So maybe you need to say, I repent of that. And I ask God to not just be my Savior and Lord, but that you regain control of my life and I give you that control back. So we're going to sing a song here. We're going to stand with that. And I'm going to ask the team, if you say, today's my day that I need to get right with God, then you come forward and just... Um, talk with one of the folks up here and they'll pray with you. Okay? So let's do that. <laughs>